Historic Woodland Cemetery, founded in 1841, is one of the oldest rural garden cemeteries in the U.S. and one of the most historic. But Woodland was not the first cemetery in Dayton. There were two earlier cemeteries. The first was established in 1805 and was situated at the corner of 3rd and Main Street. The Presbyterian Church owned this property. The second cemetery was a four-acre plot located on 5th Street between Wilkinson and Ludlow and was owned by the Methodist Church. By 1840, Dayton was growing beyond its original city boundaries and needed the space occupied by the cemeteries for its expansion. John Van Cleef stepped forward to find a new site. John wanted to establish a rural cemetery so situated as likely never to be disturbed by the onward growth and progress of the city. John, born in 1801, was the first white male child to be born in Dayton. John was a self-educated man whose interests included map making, art, engineering, the law, music, and politics. John was appointed to find the first appropriate land for the new cemetery, and he did. The owner was Augustus George, who agreed to sell 40 acres of his extensive farm for $60 per acre. Van Cleve persuaded 50 men to subscribe, each paying $100. On February 18, 1841, at the headquarters of the Fireman's Insurance Agency, the subscribers met and formed the Woodland Cemetery Association. Van Cleve was elected its first president. The chapel and the administration buildings were built in 1887. The white sandstone is from local quarries. The brown sandstone is called Lake Superior Sandstone and was mined in the Upper Great Lakes area. The main office, front gates, and chapel were placed on the National Register of Historic Buildings in 1979. When the new addition to the administration building was designed, it was a requirement of the National Register that it be built in such a way that it could be easily removed without damaging the original structure. The chapel was designed by Peters, Burns, and Pretzinger architects and cost approximately $8,000. Henry Lau, in 1904, funded a redecoration of the chapel and purchased the Tiffany window as a dedication to the memory of his young daughter, Mariana. The floor is hand-cut tile, which is also believed to be Tiffany. The current value of the Tiffany window is estimated in the $1 million range. The writing across the bottom of the window makes the piece very unique for a Tiffany window. The first stop on our tour is Irma Bombeck. Irma Fist was born in Bellbrook, Ohio. She grew up in a working class family. In 1940, Irma enters Emerson Junior High and began a, writing a humorous column for its newspaper, The Owl. In 1942, Bombeck entered Parker, now Patterson, Vocational High School, where she wrote a serious column mixing in bits of humor. Irma also began to work at the Dayton Herald as a copy girl, sharing her full-time assignment with a girlfriend. In 1943, her, for her first journalistic work, Irma interviewed Shirley Temple, who visited Dayton, and the interview became a newspaper feature. Irma Bombeck became a Dayton Journal-Herald reporter in the women's section, writing both its feature stories and a humorous housekeeping column, Operation Dust Drag. Bombeck also interviewed Eleanor Roosevelt and Mamie Eisenhower. In 1953, Irma decided to become a full-time housewife and relinquished her career as a journalist. During 1954, Irma nevertheless wrote a series of humorous columns in the Dayton Shopping News. Away from her previous journalistic career, Bombeck initiated an intense period of homemaking which lasted 10 years. In 1964, Irma Bombeck resumed her writing career for the local Kettering Oakwood Times with weekly columns which yielded $3 each. In 1965, the Dayton Journal-Herald requested new humorous columns as well, and Bombeck agreed to write two weekly 450-word columns for $50. In 1976, McGraw-Hill published Bombeck's The Grass is Always Greener Over the Septic Tank, which became a bestseller. In 1980, Bombeck arranged both a million-dollar contract for her fifth book, If Life is a Bowl of Cherries, What Am I Doing in the Pits? At the invitation of television producer Bob Shanks, Bombeck participated in Good Morning America from 1975 until 1986. I've never gotten too choked up over household hints. Once I sent a suggestion to Good Housekeeping, pointing out that dust balls stored under the bed make wonderful safe toys for the baby. <laughs> and our great little stocking stuffers. <laughs> they canceled my subscription. For several years, Bombeck became a multimedia workhorse. 
Then in 1978, she failed with the television pilot of The Grass is Always Greener on CBS. In 1980, Bombeck wrote and produced her own show, the also unsuccessful Maggie for ABC. It aired for just eight episodes to poor reviews. Bombeck was offered a second sitcom attempt, but she declined. Irma Bombeck was diagnosed with polycystic kidney disease. In 1996, she was brought to the hospital for a kidney transplant, which was performed on April the 3rd. However, she suffered complications following the procedure and died on April 22nd at the age of 69. The stone at her graveside was the only indication of Irma's burial at Woodland until 2020. Irma sat on the rock in Arizona and would do some of her writings there. Next on our tour is Adam Schantz. Adam Schantz Sr. was born in Germany on September 7, 1839. There were five brothers, all of whom left Germany on April the 11th, 1854 to escape the military. Adam was the youngest. They landed in New York in May of 1854. He worked for his uncle, Michael Schantz, who operated a flour mill in Altoona, Pennsylvania. He remained there for about a year, then came to Dayton to learn a trade of butcher from Michael Olt. In 1862, he opened a small meat shop on East 5th Street near Brown Street. He later purchased what was known as the Six Mile House on Covington Pike, keeping a bachelor's hall and conducting his butcher business. On March 29, 1863, he married Salome Latin. They had nine children. After several successful years, his slaughterhouse was burned down to the ground, destroying his inventory of lard, tallow, hides, and pelts on which there was no insurance. After he rebuilt his beef and pork packing plant, he traded the property to Joseph Steckline for property on River Street. Here he began business as a much larger scale. Yet five years later, disaster was to strike again. In 1876, lightning struck the plant, burning it to the ground. The blow was severe, Adam finding out that his insurance had expired at noon. A misunderstanding with the insurance company had been the cause of the lapse. On the following day, he gathered together carpenters, stonemasons, and brick masons and told them of his financial condition. They all agreed to rebuild the plant even larger than ever and then wait for him to pay at his convenience. With the help of these men, Adam went on to establish a business conceded to be the largest in Dayton at the time. He had a stall in the market house, a meat shop at 408 West 3rd Street, and another on River Street. In 1882, Adam, together with his brother George, formed a partnership and entered into the lager beer industry, calling it the Riverside. This partnership lasted until June 23, 1887, when Adam bought out his brother's interest. He immediately enlarged the plant, which was part of the slaughterhouse erected in 1876. Breweries needed pure water, and Adam devised a water purification system. He named the water Lily Water after his family's favorite flower, the calla lily. He sold Lily Water to other brewers and began bottling and selling the product to the public. He owned 100 acres of land in Oakwood where he built a racetrack. Adam died in 1903 at the age of 73. Adam's estate was estimated to be worth a million and a half dollars. He had the dubious distinction of being the largest individual taxpayer in both Montgomery County, Ohio and Volusia County, Florida. Here lies Johnny Morehouse. He is one of the most famous and often visited sites at Woodland. People from all over the world visit the monument because they have heard the story or have seen the photo of the site. In 1860, Johnny was about five years old. His father was a cobbler whose shop was located along the Dayton Canal, which ran through the center of the city. The canal later became Patterson Boulevard. As most children would do, Johnny used to play alongside the canal. One day he fell in and his constant companion, his dog, jumped in to save him. The dog was able to pull the boy from the water, but Johnny had drowned. The dog is not buried with Johnny, but the story goes that the dog would visit his young master's graveside on a daily basis. He would be fed by visitors and eventually he never returned. Johnny's family could not afford a headstone, so noted local sculptor Daniel Ladau carved the marble tombstone. It bears no dates, just the words, slumber sweet. Carved replicas of a ball, top, cap, and mouth harp adorn the stone. These were the items said to have been found in the boy's pockets at the time of his death. Occasionally, mementos decorating the site are left by those who have lost a child or a pet or simply have heard the story and want to remember the boy and his dog. You will see pennies left here and at the Wright Brothers site. 
There are three explanations for what the pennies represent. In European Jewish cemeteries, it was a tradition to leave small pebbles atop a stone to honor those who have passed and to show respect for that person. The pebbles became pennies in this country. The Egyptians laid pennies on the eyes of the dead before burying them. Finally, in Greek mythology, it was said that if you had to pay the boatman, Sharon, in copper to be transported across the river Styx to the land of the dead. Sergeant Lucius Rice is our next stop on our tour. In 1909, Lucius J. Rice was one of the two colored members of the Dayton Police Force. Mr. Rice had been second sergeant of company C-O-N-G for two years and distinguished himself at Lake Erie in 1908 by winning a government medal for his marksmanship. He belonged to the colored K of P and the Elks Lodge. Sergeant Rice was the first black man on the Dayton Police Force to hold a supervisory position. In 1926, Lucius Rice demonstrated his courage in a confrontation with the man wanted by the police. In an attempt to arrest the man, a gun battle ensued. Although seriously injured by a gunshot wound to the abdomen, Sergeant Rice was able to shoot and kill his attacker. Sergeant Rice survived that encounter and became a detective sergeant. In 1939, Sergeant Rice, Sergeant Wheeler, and several detectives searched for a murder suspect by entering a home on College Street. Sergeant Rice took the lead in the search. Suddenly, the suspects emerged from a closet firing his revolver. In the gun battle, Sergeant Rice was shot several times and struck in the abdomen for the second time in his career. The suspect was apprehended, but Sergeant Rice died from his wounds five days later on October 5, 1939. His career spanned 30 years. His murderer was tried, convicted, and executed. John Rouser is recognized as the master builder of Dayton. After serving his apprenticeship, he worked from 1844 to 1854 as a carpenter before going into business for himself. He worked initially out of the old Bomberger flour mill, where he put into operation the first iron frame molding machine in the United States. Just a year after erecting a brick four-story planning mill on the east side of the canal, he manufactured building materials, office furniture, and according to his ad, stairways as a specialty. His big break came with a contract to build the Turner Opera House, now known as the Victoria Theater. He was a builder locally of many other major structures, including the Old County Jail, which was demolished as part of Courthouse Square project, and the Callahan Building. He was engaged to build major buildings in other cities, many of them still in use. The courthouses in Springfield, Sydney, and Tiffin, Ohio. He was a major Dayton manufacturer as well. His planning mill employed 200 men annually. Longtime Daytonians can recall most fondly his last major project. Just before his death in 1893, he completed the Still High School building, which was then considered to be one of the finest in the country. And now it's time for some murder mystery, the story of Christina Kett. For 17 long years, everybody in Dayton wondered who killed pretty 18-year-old Christine Kett. On the cold and snowy afternoon of January the 11th, 1867, neighbors of the family of Mrs. Christina Kett were attracted by screams of a youthful member of the family. He appeared at their doors calling frantically to them to hurry to his home that a terrible crime had been committed, that his sister Christine was lying on the cellar steps, her head bashed in and blood smearing her entire body. It was while the police were examining the body that Mrs. Christina Kett, mother of the girl, arrived at the house. Noting the crowd congregated at the front door and in the yard, she instantly became hysterical and roughly elbowed her way forward, apparently ignoring all attempts of the neighbors to extend sympathy and comfort. She reached the kitchen and saw the mangled body of her daughter in a pool of blood and her grief was pitiful. Then on the 15th day of March, 1884, they had positive evidence. The mystery surrounding the most horrible and fiendish murder which has ever been committed in this city and which at that time and ever since has baffled the police came to light yesterday with the deathbed confession of Mrs. Christina Kett, which was made to her youngest son, in which she acknowledged having committed the terrible crime 17 years ago. On the morning of that tragic day, her daughter and another lady left the house together. She was baking bread and her daughter was, a, was to get the dinner at noon. She did not arrive home until the middle of the afternoon, however, 
and when she returned, Mrs. Kett became so enraged, she seized a short-handled ax and hit her on the head. The girl ran to the cellar door, but she was caught and fell on the spot. After she saw that she had killed her daughter, she at once commenced to cover up her tracks. She took her son's revolver and powder flash, placed her daughter's finger in the flask, smeared powder on her face. Then she left the house and did not return until evening. When she came back, the house was filled with people who broke the news of the foul murder to her. She immediately pretended to be frantic with grief. She said that after she committed the murder, she regretted it exceedingly, and the image of her daughter seemed to be haunting her wherever she went. The confession was made to Mrs. Kett's son, and she was careful that no one else was in the room when she made the disclosure. She asked her son not to reveal her confession, but it weighed so heavy on his mind that he finally had to tell the story to the local newspaper. Just how Charles Stimmel became tied in with the Old Cook Gang, later known as the Rose Schaefer Gang, probably will never be known. For several years previous, the Dayton Police Department and Springfield had experienced considerable trouble with the Cook Boys and the associates whom they had organized into a gang. Larceny was the commonest charge against the outfit, though occasionally the two cities found it necessary to lodge an assault and battery complaint against one of them. Police learned to recognize Charles as the leading member of the Cook Gang. They also learned that he was an admirer of pretty little Rose Cook. Charles had made plans to rob the local feed store during the night. Once inside the office, one of the gang members demanded that Joseph Scheid unlock the safe. He stated that he did not know where the key was, whereupon the man who gave the command fired. The bullet struck Scheid in the leg, and it was as he bent over to grasp the injured leg that a second shot was fired. This one entered his heart, and death was instantaneous. A year had passed, and one day Stimmel's mother sent an express package addressed to Charles Coverley in Denver. It was a long-awaited tip, and with the address in hand, Denver police proceeded to pounce upon the man who signed for the package. That man proved to be Stimmel. He and Rose had been living in a remote part of Denver under the name Mr. and Mrs. Charles Coverley. Rose, however, was not apprehended at the time. Stimmel was tried and convicted of the murder of Joseph Scheid and was electrocuted on the night of July 21st, 1904. He faced his fate calmly and told the warden, don't put that thing over my eyes yet. I've got something to say. May the curse of the dying man be on Judge Cumler, on Prosecutor Martin, and on his assistant, Charles Kumler, for sending me here. I have never killed anyone. Now go on with your dirty work. Levitt Lazerne Custer. The first of Levitt Lazerne Custer's many inventions was the Custer Bubble Stratoscope. The purpose was to register the rise and fall of aircraft. Since it was without moving parts and was much sturdier than the models being used at the time, Custer was awarded a patent in 1912 at the age of 24. This invention was to be used in balloons for which he had a passion. The first models were sent to the Army. After testing proved the value of the device, the Navy began to order the stratoscope. In 1916, he decided to start his own company and had a four-story brick building constructed on Franklin Street. On the fourth floor, he built it the first indoor miniature golf course. The second floor became an oceanarium with more than 100 tanks filled with tropical fish. In later years, a large arrow was painted on the roof of the factory, which helped guide pilots to McCook's Field. About 1925, the Custer Park car came into being. Built as an amusement ride, the car was battery operated and could be used on any track. It was popular with amusement park operators since any vacant lot could become Custer Car Speedway. Custer's next success was the Custer Sea Cycle, a small paddle wheel propelled watercraft. It worked on the same principle as the bicycle, with the pedals turning the paddle wheel in the back. It turned out to be another popular ride at amusement parks. One of his final inventions was the two-passenger buckboard motor vehicle. Patented in 1958, it was equipped with an electric or gasoline motor. Designed for outdoors use, it was used by former President Dwight Eisenhower's son David, and it was said that the Emperor of Ethiopia used one to drive around his palace grounds. Custer's Specialty Company's final location was at 139 Bradford Street. 
A fire gutted the building and its contents were destroyed, including Custer's drawing, models, and personal notes. An interesting footnote about one invention, Gladys Custer stated that her husband believed that corporal punishment had a place in the school system and offered to build the Dayton Board of Education a whipping machine. The board did not seem enthused and the device never made it off the drawing board. Turning around and gazing into Potter's Field, you find the final resting place of Maggie Lehman. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed Maggie was once described as being rather stout, but that didn't seem to slow the steady stream of men that visited her apartment where she lived with her four children. It was common knowledge that several men a day called on her, many of them married. One of her more frequent visitors was Jacob Harvey. Jacob was well known to the police. When asked, he would give his occupation as a railroad man, but the law considered his real living came from being a pimp and a thief. Neighbors began complaining that Maggie's children were constantly being left alone. On February 4th, 1891, her four children were placed in the children's home. Distraught, Maggie decided that she would try to turn her life around so that she could get her children back. When she told Jacob about the plan, he became upset, stating that she was better off without the children, as that would give the two of them more time together. When she continued to miss her children, Jacob began physically and verbally abusing Maggie. She finally had him arrested for assault. In April 1891, her children were allowed back home. The day that Harvey left the workhouse, he immediately went to Maggie's apartment. She tried to fend him off by stating that she had a new boyfriend, Newton Chubb, who worked as a bartender at the Abbey. She warned Harvey that he had better never cross her path when Chubb was with her, as Chubb had threatened to kill Jacob if he interfered with them. Jacob begged Maggie to come back to him and nearly beat her to death when she refused. Jacob was arrested again and while serving his second sentence, he swore to the officers and to the other prisoners that he planned to escape and kill Maggie and her new boyfriend. In September, Jacob finally was able to escape. Two days later, at about 10.20 p.m., William McLaughlin, an inmate of the soldier's home, was passing by the abbey when he heard a scream and a pistol shot. He turned just in time to see Jacob dragging Maggie onto the porch and placing his revolver behind her left ear, firing a shot and killing her. After the shooting, Jacob walked to the Point Saloon and asked the owner, Al Block, for a glass of beer. Then lighting a cigar, he remarked, I just killed a damn bitch down there. I shot her twice. Lorenzo Landstroth was born December 25, 1810 in Philadelphia. He became a pastor of the South Congressional Church in Andover, Massachusetts in May of 1836 and was a teacher at Yale University. In 1852, he moved to Oxford, Ohio and took up the work of beekeeping for which he is best known. The world of insects held a fascination for Lorenzo from a very early age, but the one that turned out to be his lifelong ambition was the bee. It was while visiting the home of one of his church members, who was a keeper of bees, that his interest in beekeeping once again revived. Lorenzo tried his hand at beekeeping and quickly became dissatisfied with the primitive methods of harvesting the honey. He read the latest books of his time, but their methods were crude, resulting in the death of a large amount of the bee population. So in order to attain the honey, he constructed a beehive which contained a baseboard where the bees entered. Before Lorenzo's invention, the bees attached their combs to the walls of the hive, and the only way to get the comb out was to cut them out, which spoiled the comb and wasted much honey. His hive housed a removable frame, a place to store the excess honey, and a roof. He left a space between the hive wall and the frames in which the combs were built. The bees did not build across the space, leaving the comb frames free to be easily removed by the beekeeper. His book, Landstroth on the Hive and the Honey Bee, was written in 1853, was reprinted, revised, and translated into various languages before and after his death. Though his invention was used throughout the world, he made little money because of infringements on his copyright. This monument is dedicated to Madame Elizabeth Richter, a.k.a. Lib Hedges. She was born Elizabeth Richter in Germany in 1840. Elizabeth began working as a servant in the lawyer's house on 2nd Street at the age of 16. Two years later, she married Joseph Hedges. The marriage didn't last. She was a tall, striking woman with piles of red hair on top of her head, strong features, and much given to frilled shirtwaists and long billowing skirts for daytime wear and elaborate brocades and velvet for evening. 
She opened a saloon on South Main Street opposite the fairgrounds in 1876, where she sold beer in the front rooms at five cents a glass and dispensed other attractions in the back room at considerably higher prices. Elizabeth had a flair, her customers came again and again. She soon added to her staff, recruiting only girls from out of town, being canny enough to avoid entanglements that local girls might bring on. For seven years, she ran the South Main Street Saloon. By then, she had saved enough money to build an impressive palace at 30 Warren Street near the canal. She took on a partner. This was her younger sister, who for business purposes adopted the name of Louisa La Fontaine. Louisa was 26. Three years after expanding into the Warren Street house, Mrs. Hedges set up her sister independently in a fine house on the corner of Howard and Pearl. Elizabeth kept a house for 39 years, and in all that time, no one denied that Mrs. Hedges had the finest house, the prettiest girls, and the most genteel clients. Oh, how the money rolled in. Lib invested her surplus in stocks and real estate. At one time, she owned over 100 pieces of property in the city. She was generous. She set a fine table for the girls and personally saw to it that each one had a bank account. If any girl decided to marry and leave her establishment, Elizabeth would give her a lovely wedding and set the couple up in one of her properties. If one died, as happened a few times, she gave her a fine funeral and a resting place at Woodland Cemetery. Elizabeth was generous with her contributions to charity. In 1913, Dayton was struck by the worst flood in its history. Both her houses, as well as 50 other pieces of real estate she owned, were in the destructive water. To clear out the mud and filth, to replace damaged siding, foundations, and furnishing, to paint, plaster, and otherwise restore the buildings were larger tax and very expensive. An earnest worker for the Flood Relief Committee called on her for a donation. Flood Relief, Elizabeth shouted, why come to me? I need flood relief for myself, not to be asked to donate to a fund. At that, I suggested I'm better off than a lot of people, the poor devils. I'll give you something, but it's not going to be much. I'll give you $2,000 and not another goddamn cent. In 1915, the police ordered all bordellos in the city to be closed. Elizabeth closed her establishment and continued to live at the Pearl Street house. Now we have arrived at the most visited place in Woodland Cemetery, the Wright family. There are three flags that mark the monument side of the Wright Brothers family burial site. It is the most visited and honored site at Woodland Cemetery. They are Orville and Wilbur, their sister Catherine, their mother Susan, their father Milton reside. The remains of o Ida and Otis Wright were removed from Greencastle Cemetery and brought to the family grave. The twins had died in 1870 when they were only a few days old. The boy's interest in flying was sparked by a self-propelling toy their father had brought home. They enjoyed everything mechanical and in 1888 they built a large printing press that they used to publish the West Side News. In 1892 they opened a bicycle shop on West 3rd Street. This is where they tested many of their earliest theories about flying mechanics. When Orville was five, he started kindergarten. Mrs. Wright walked him to school for the first day. Two weeks later, she decided to go to school and see how he was getting along. Inquiring as to how her son was faring, the surprised teacher said that the young boy had not come back to school since that first day. When Mrs. Wright asked why Orville had not been attending class, he told her he had been going to the house of a friend to fix a broken sewing machine. In 1900, they began designing their first full-size man-carrying aircraft, which they originally intended to use as a kite and control from the ground. The first flights of the tethered kite were made without a pilot on board. Their aircraft did not develop as much lift as they had expected, and the flights were disappointing. On October 18th, Wilbur climbed on board and flew gliding without the constraints of a tether. They returned to Dayton with plans to come again the next year with a larger glider. Catherine was a very close friend and confidant to her brothers and provided a great deal of support. When Hawthorne Hill was built, it was intended for it to be for the two brothers and their sister. Wilbur died in 1912 before its completion. Orville and Catherine lived there until her marriage. It is said that Orville was so upset by his sister leaving that he refused to speak to her. When she became ill, Lauren persuaded his brother to visit his dying sister. He went to Catherine's house, entered the room, told her he forgave her for leaving him, turned on his heels, and left. 
Just as in life, Paul Lawrence Dunbar was neighbors to the right. He's our next stop. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was born on June 27, 1872 to freed slaves from Kentucky. He became one of the first influential black poets in American literature and was internationally acclaimed for his dialect verse. Dunbar began showing literary promise while still in high school in Dayton, Ohio, where he lived with his widowed mother. The only African American in his class, he became class president and class poet. By 1889, two years before he graduated, he had already published poems in the Dayton Herald and worked as an editor of the short-lived Dayton Tatler, a black newspaper published by classmate Orville Wright. Paul Dunbar, in addition to his poetry, wrote operas and other musical compositions. A death song is also portrayed in a stained glass window in Woodland's Mausoleum. Dunbar was a beloved poet and had 58 Dunbar high schools named after him throughout the USA. Though he continued to write and publish, Dunbar's health continued to decline. Relying on alcohol to temper his chronic coughing only exacerbated his illness. And by the winter of 1905, he was fatally ill. He died on February 9th, 1906 at age 33. Behind Paul Stone is the site of his mother, Matilda Dunbar. Matilda was a slave on a Kentucky plantation. The owner of the plantation was an educated man who allowed Matilda to come to the broad front porch of the house on the evenings when he would read to his wife and children. Matilda was required to sit at the far end of the porch away from the family. It was from this experience that Matilda learned to love the written word, especially poetry. At the end of the Civil War, Matilda left the farm to come to Dayton. She heard that other members of her family had relocated to this city. This is where she met and married her husband. Their small house was situated not far from a school. Soon Matilda was offering the children who walked by her home after school to stop in for milk and cookies. It was from these school children that Matilda learned to read and write. Her love for the written word was passed on to her son who wrote his first poem at six years old. Down the hill lies Maurice Desjardins. He was a French Canadian from Montreal. At age 39, he felt life owed him more. His earlier life in Montreal had been less than successful. In 1961 in Joliet, Quebec, he was caught robbing a bank at night. He served one of the two year sentence at prison Montreal for that crime. It brought estrangement from his wife and four children, so he moved to the US. He had a good job as an electrician on a construction job at Armco Steel in Middletown. But his lifestyle and appetite for betting on horses at the Lebanon Raceway and River Downs soon exhausted his financial resources. Maurice robbed his first bank in Centerville and he thought that his luck had changed. His landlady and her attractive daughter would be impressed with his newfound wealth. The first thing he was going to buy was a car. The car was delivered to his rooming house in Middletown the next day and he couldn't wait to drive it over to the racetrack for an evening's betting. By this time, Desjardins needed more money and decided to rob the bank a second time. Desjardins had shown a lot more confidence his second time around and had secured $7,900 for his efforts. On his third attempt of robbing the bank, he once again had his bag filled by all of the tellers. One teller placed her bait money and marked $20 bills into the stack. Maurice ran as fast as he could through the underbrush and trees. He was unaware that the discomfort in his leg was caused by a bullet. He only knew he could see a policeman moving behind him through an orchard. As he moved out of the woods, he saw a garage door open. Opening the house door quietly, he moved around the room. No one appeared to be home. Clothes, he thought. He needed new clothes. Upstairs he went, looked in a hall closet for men's clothing. They were there just waiting for him. He quickly took off his shirt and muddy pants and then put on some clean trousers and a shirt. At that moment, he heard women's voices in the kitchen. He quickly placed the brown paper bag of money in an open athletic bag and closed the closet door. Down the stairs and into the living room he went, but he was caught. Maurice Raymond Desjardins lay on his jail cell cot and agonized over a solution to his desperate situation. It seemed there was no way out. He could never face anyone he knew again. He had decided to end his life. He hung himself. The Centerville Historic Society gave Maurice a headstone. It reads, this limerick is for poor Maurice, who two times avoided the police. When he tried it again, his greed did him in. Now he lies in this grave, rest in peace. Carolyn Dudley was born in Lexington, Kentucky. Her father was Orson Dudley, a wholesale dried goods merchant of means who gave to his daughter every advantage that money could bestow. 
Her mother was Catherine Dudley. Her father died when she was quite young and Caroline and her mother moved to Dayton. A vivacious redhead, Caroline was the most popular debutante in the 1876-77 social season. She aspired to the stage from childhood, but for family reasons, she never appeared publicly, even at amateur entertainments. After a visit to Chicago, she returned to Dayton and announced her engagement to Mr. Leslie Carter, a wealthy lawyer and aristocrat. At that time, she was considered a great belle as she was a strikingly beautiful girl. They had one child, a son, Dudley Carter. In 1887, she filed for divorce on the grounds of physical assault and abandonment. But in 1889, Mr. Carter obtained the divorce, accusing her of adultery. Son Dudley chose to live with his mother and was cut off from his father's will as a result. A huge scandal ensued in Chicago and was closely followed by all the papers. Her husband told her she would get nothing from her marriage and she received no money from the union. Caroline went to Paris and after a few years abroad returned to the States. She studied acting and became one of the most successful actresses of her time. She appeared in over 45 plays and several early films, and as her stage name, she used Mrs. Leslie Carter. She hated the name, but wanted to see it in lights to spite her former husband. Here lies Bessie Little. On Tuesday, September 2nd, 1896, a young man named E.L. Harper was visiting relatives in Riverdale during a heat wave of the city and decided to walk down to the river and go for a swim to cool off. Instead of a relaxing swim, he came upon the body that had been decaying in the city's heat and ran to the nearest boathouse for help. The body was then sent to an undertaker and on Wednesday, the story was all over the newspaper. Cashier who worked at the Cooper Hotel on 2nd and Ludlow Street saw the paper and the description of the young woman they had found and called the authorities. Within an hour after the call, the police chief had found the family the body belonged to, and the mother confirmed that Bessie Little had not been home for weeks. Mrs. Little disclosed that Bessie was pregnant and now she had disgraced their family because she surely had taken her own life and everyone would know about her wrongdoing. The police brought in Bessie's boyfriend, the suspected father of her unborn child, Albert Franz, who lived on West 2nd Street. He denied having anything to do with the death of Bessie and was held at the police station pending further investigation. The police uncovered that Bessie had been staying at the Cooper Hotel and her room had been paid for from August 20th through August 28th by Albert. And a witness said she was last seen leaving with him. After identifying the side combs from Bessie's mother and the jeweler who had crafted them, the police told the undertaker to dig up the body and check for bullet holes, primarily in the head region. The undertaker returned with Bessie's skull and showed where there were two bullet holes in her right ear. They searched the river but never found the gun and a trial proceeded. Albert told Chief Farrell that he had taken Bessie for a ride and that as they approached the bridge, she shot herself twice in the head. He panicked and thinking he would would be blamed for her death, he threw her body into the river. Bessie's head was even brought into the courtroom in a glass jar as evidence showing the bullet hole. Prosecutors said the first bullet killed Bessie and it was impossible for her to pull the trigger the second time. After two hours of deliberating, Albert was found guilty of first degree murder and was sentenced to die in the electric chair on Friday, May 13, 1897. Bessie's parents went to Woodland Cemetery and selected a grave in section 111 near Wyoming Street where they reburied Bessie from Potter's Field. Today, the Ridge Avenue Bridge will forever be known as Bessie Little Bridge. Here lies Jordan Anderson. Jordan was born in December 1825, someplace in Tennessee. He became a slave of the General Paulding Anderson of Big Spring, Wilson County, Tennessee, sometime around 1833, when he was seven or eight years old. General Anderson was a somewhat famous man in Wilson County, having once served in the state legislature. Jordan lived as a servant of the Anderson family for 39 years. In 1848, Jordan married Amanda McGregor, he being 23, she being 19 at the time. Over the years, Amanda had 11 children. Jordan and his family left Colonel Anderson sometime in 1864 with Jordan receiving his free papers from the Provost Marshal General of the Department of Nashville, Tennessee, and getting a job at a hospital in Nashville. Jordan and his family eventually made it safely to Dayton.
In July 1865, Jordan received a letter from his former owner, Colonel Anderson. The letter kindly asked Jordan to return to work on the plantation because it had fallen into disarray during the war. On August 7, 1865, Jordan dictated his response through his new boss, Valentine Winters, and it was published in the Cincinnati Commercial. The letter entitled, Letter from a Freed Man to His Old Master, was not only hilarious, but it showed compassion, defiance, and dignity. That year, the letter would be published in the New York Daily Tribune and Lydia Marie Child's The Freed Man's Book. The last and final stop on this tour is the Howe family. Oliver Howe was born, raised, and married in Dayton. He opened his first medical practice in 1893 on West Germantown Street, but was forced to move often within and outside the Dayton area to escape suspicious deaths, bad medical practices. Being in bad health and separated from his wife, Dr. Howe was living with his parents eight miles from Dayton. Neighbors saw the Howe home in flames last Sunday. When they reached the house, they found Dr. Howe in the yard, having dragged himself out. He said just in time to save his life. His father, mother, and brother were burned to death. The fire occurred about one o'clock in the morning. Dr. Howe's account of the affair was incoherent and the coroner, after an investigation, arrested the physician. Dr. Howe is a drug fiend and has often been under treatment for the morphine habit. It is stated that when unable to procure the drug, his cravings have driven him into a frenzy in which he was violent and on recovering from the attack, he has regained no memory of his acts. It is now charged that Dr. Howe poisoned his relatives and then set fire to the house. His burns are not serious and it is known that a few days before the fire, he had obtained from Cleveland a considerable quantity of the drug. It has been discovered since his arrest that while practicing in Lima, Ohio, last year, Dr. Howe was attentive to Mrs. Mary Tooney, who died mysteriously last April. Her brother is said to have accused Howe of retaining unlawful possession of some of the woman's jewelry. It is also said that a woman Dr. Howe lived with in Toledo died suddenly and mysteriously, and that afterward he went to Chicago where he married a woman named Mrs. Patterson, who died under circumstances that suggested poisoning. Dr. Howe has been in a seemingly dazed condition since his arrest and indifferent to the death of his relatives or the charges pending against him. His only desire is for the daily amount of morphine allowed him. He made no confession to any of the crimes. He was convicted of killing his family and sentenced to be executed in Ohio by electric chair in Columbus. The remains of his entire family are buried here together in one grave in Woodland Cemetery. We hope you enjoyed visiting the final resting place of some of Woodland's historic, mysterious, and murdered individuals. Be sure to visit our website at www.woodlandcemetery.org for more exciting tours and information. Feel free to also make a donation to the Woodland Foundation, which makes these tours and events possible. 